Uh, thank you all very much for coming, uh, and I thank uh, you all for, for hosting us. Uh, we've got a crisis in healthcare, as we all know. Um, it's too expensive uh, in all kinds of ways, uh, but one of the effects of that is there's enormous pressure on what I think are the most important uh, people in our healthcare system, and it's the primary care providers. It's the first stop that any of us have when our kids are sick, when we're sick. And the primary care doctor is the one who knows the patient and establishes a relationship with the patient, who gets the trust of the patient. And it's a, it's a, it's a blessed calling to be a primary care physician. And it's extraordinary for any of us whenever we've had a person we care about be sick uh, or when we've been sick uh, to basically entrust ourselves to the judgment and the skills of our primary uh, care providers. The crisis that primary care is facing is that in our upside down, extraordinarily expensive uh, health care system, uh, we're putting a squeeze on primary care, paying them less than it uh, costs oftentimes uh, to provide the care that they need. We're loading them up with incredible amounts of paperwork. Uh, because of the technology, they're uh, having to uh, pick up the incredible expense and burden of updating software systems and technology capabilities throughout. So what has happened is that you have this healthcare system where we're spending literally trillions, where there are parts in the system where there's an enormous expense that is not controlled at all. I'm talking about the pharmaceuticals uh, is a particular example. Uh, surgical medical supplies is another. Uh, the ability of uh, pharmacy benefit managers to put the squeeze on everyone. And all of these costs, by the way, get passed on to an individual who is buying health insurance to our businesses that really are also buying employer-sponsored health care and care deeply about the quality of coverage for uh, their employees. And of course, taxpayers uh, through Medicare and Medicare, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, pardon me. So what you've seen is a system, in my view, where there's an unwillingness to focus on what we need for fair reimbursement for the folks who are the least compensated, but in my view, the most important, and that's the primary care physicians. So uh, with bipartisan support, uh, I am sponsoring uh, the, physi the physician fee stabilization uh, bill. And essentially what that would do is take some of the pressure off uh, the, the payments and allowing payments to increase to keep up with the cost that our primary care physicians are experiencing constantly. And just to give a sense of how widely shared this concern is that I just expressed, uh, my co-sponsor on this is John Boozman, uh, a conservative senator uh, from Alabama. Uh, another co-sponsor, Angus King, an independent from Maine. Another, Tom Tillis, a conservative Republican uh, from North Carolina. And what that demonstrates uh, in, 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 a, in a doctor, uh, Dr. Marshall from, uh, uh, from Kansas. And what it demonstrates is that whether you're a physician, primary care physician right here in Vermont, or you're a primary care physician in Kansas, a deep red state, or you're a primary a care physician in North Carolina, rural North Carolina, or Maine, our physicians are respected but underpaid. And it's not as though we're not spending an incredible amount of money on health care, but we're not necessarily spending it in the right places. So if we're going to have that quality of care that starts with well-trained, motivated, caring primary care physicians, the person that translates for us what's happening, who is a link with us if we have to see a specialist, who's our ongoing advisor if we have to be hospitalized. We have to make certain 
that those primary care doctors can make a living in a very tough circumstance. So I regard this legislation, as do my colleagues, as absolutely essential. Now, how do we get it passed? It's always the challenge. Our hope is that at the end of the year, uh, the end, and that could be coming soon, because it could be the end of the budget year, when there's a must-pass bill, uh, we and my colleagues are going to do the very best that we can to get this included. Uh, so I believe this is absolutely essential for the well-being uh, of health in Vermont, because we're not going to have healthy Vermonters without a healthy primary care uh, uh, doctor community. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. I appreciate the hospitality. And now I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jessa Barnard, who's done great work on behalf of the society, uh, and will speak. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Jessa Barnard. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Medical Society. We are the state's largest physician and physician assistant membership association, representing clinicians in primary care, specialty care, and across all practice settings, so independent practice, FQHCs, and hospital-based. And I want to thank uh, the press who's here this morning. Uh, thank you to our members. You'll hear more from them um, this morning, Dr. Toby Sadkin and Dr. Ann Morris, who will tell you about the impact of Medicare cuts on their practices and patients. Thank you to Primary Care Health Partners for hosting us. And thank you, most importantly, to Senator Welsh for sponsoring the Physician Fee Stabilization Act and his longstanding commitment to supporting primary care and primary care providers in our state. Year after year, the Medicare physician fee schedule has experienced actual uh, cuts. Uh, CMS has proposed another 2.8 percent cut for 2025, following across the board cuts in 2021, 2022, 2023, and 2024. That means between 20, uh, 2001 and 2024, physicians have seen their payments from Medicare fall by 29 percent. The Vermont Medical Society's motto is not for ourselves do we labor. And I can tell you from meeting hundreds of doctors across the state that Vermont's physicians have gone into medicine and chosen to practice here to help their patients. So why are we here today talking about a financial issue? Because if services are not paid for, medical practices in Vermont won't be able to keep their doors open to serve the needs of Vermonters. Some may be forced to close altogether, while others may have to make the heartbreaking decision to limit how many Medicare patients they can see. And because we're talking about Medicare, this means Vermonters with disabilities and seniors, some of our most vulnerable patients across the state. Vermont practices are particularly hard hit with this issue because when our, when the, um, our Medicaid fee, uh, fee schedule follows the same formula as Medicare. So when Medicare's payments are cut, Medicaid's payments are also cut. These cuts undermine our state's and Congress's efforts to address key health care priorities. This means for 2025, services aimed at increasing access for mental health and improving suicide prevention will be decreased by 2.8 percent. Services connecting to connect for connecting patients with social health determinant of needs to community resources and care coordination will be cut by 2.8 percent. Services to pervert, preserve eyesight, primary care office visits, mammography screening, Maternity care will all be cut. Um, so we call on our other US senators and representatives to join with Senator Welsh from all across the country to do what is right for seniors, to be part of the solution to this flawed aspect of the <coughs> Medicare payment system. So thank you, and I'll turn to Dr. Toby Sadkin. Thanks, Jessica. <coughs> I am Dr. Toby Sadkin. I'm a family physician at St. Albans Primary Care, and I'm the chair of Primary Care Health Partners, which is the largest independent primary care group in Vermont. Our group, Primary Care Health Partners, has 10 office locations throughout the state, extending from Brattleboro and Bennington in the southern part of the state to the Burlington area and north to St. Albans and Enosburg Falls. We provide primary care to over 30,000 Vermonters. And in some of our practices, the combination of Medicare and Medicaid makes up 60% of the patients in the practice. Primary Care Health Partners extends our sincere thanks to Senator Welch for <coughs> introducing the Physician Fee Stabilization <coughs> Act. This is an important step 
toward helping all independent practices stay open and available to meet the needs of Vermonters, especially those with Medicare coverage. There are many independent medical practices in Vermont, including both primary care and specialty care. These practices have been faced with the challenge of year <coughs> over year decreases to Medicare payments. While primary care is the foundation of health care, the payment for primary care has not kept up with the cost to provide these services. As we are all experiencing, costs for almost everything have been increasing, yet Medicare payment for primary care has decreased yearly for the past four years and is scheduled to decrease further with a CMS proposal for a 2.8% cut to primary care payments in 2025. And because Medicaid payments are based on the Medicare fee schedule, when Medicare payments decrease, Medicaid payments also decrease. In the face of decreasing Medicare reimbursements, we have also faced increases in the cost to keep our practices open. We have attempted to keep wages and benefits competitive in order to recruit and retain providers and support staff. We have also been met with double-digit increases in health insurance premiums for our employees and significant increased costs for things like supplies, equipment, and utilities. Unlike other businesses, we cannot simply increase our prices when our costs go up. When we agree to participate in Medicare and Medicaid, we agree to accept their payments. We agree to participate even with low reimbursement rates because we are passionate about taking the best care of our patients. Yet with year over year cuts in Medicare payments, the viability of primary care practices is at stake. Without adequate support for primary care, we run the risk of losing primary care practices. It is not uncommon for us to hear from our Medicare patients that they have had difficulty finding a primary care practice that is open to new Medicare patients. It is crucial that we continue to ensure access to primary care, including for Vermonters covered by Medicare. So we are extremely grateful to Senator Welch for bringing this important issue forward. And I will turn it over to Ann. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ann Morris. I'm a family physician who practices in Milton, Vermont, the director of the Family Medicine Residency Training Program in Burlington, and the president of the Vermont Academy of Family Physicians. As the director of the Family Medicine Residency Program, I'm enthusiastic about ensuring we have a next generation of doctors to take care of the primary care needs of Vermonters. Unfortunately, there are many headwinds working against us. Physicians are aging faster than we can train new clinicians. High student loan debt and high paperwork burdens make primary care look unattractive to students. And on top of that, low and declining payments for primary care make keeping an office open difficult. I want to share a few numbers from the latest survey of licensed physicians in Vermont. First, between uh, 2012 and uh, 2022, Primary care FTEs in Vermont declined by 59. That means about a 13% drop. Second, primary care physicians are aging. 32% of primary care physicians are over the age of 60, as compared to 29% in 2014, 19% in 2008, and 9% in 2002. Finally, while 78% uh, of primary care physicians report that they accept new patients, only 69% are accepting new Medicare patients, a considerable decline since 2020. What does this mean for Vermonters? It's hard for everyone to find a new primary care clinician, but even harder if you have Medicare. At the same time, it's crucial that our older patients and patients with disabilities, so those with Medicare, have a source for their chronic care check-ins, 
preventative care, and help coordinating the services that their physician um, orders for them. This requires continuity. It helps to develop trust between the patient and their physician. It reduces uh, emergency and hospital visits, and it improves healthcare outcomes. We therefore need to be alarmed that last year, one of our state's largest independent primary care offices was faced with the extremely difficult decision to relocate about 400 Medicare patients due to difficulties with clinician recruitment and retention, leading to an even more exacerbated problem with access to care. Year in and year out, Medicare fee schedule reductions are destabilizing our practices and reducing our ability to invest in primary care for rural Vermonters. We must do better. Senator Welch's bill to help prevent further cuts to Medicare payments is a critical step towards ensuring Vermonters with Medicare can find a regular source for their medical needs within their medical home. The Vermont Medical Society and the Vermont Academy of Family Physicians thank Senator Welch for introducing this important legislation and call on Congress to join him in fixing our broken Medicare payment system. Thank you. Excellent. You've got to take uh, any questions to any of the doctors or me, whatever you'd like. This might be a question for one of the doctors in the room. I'm sure you all are familiar with the kind of phenomenon of people not being able to get a primary care doctor and then just defaulting right. to an urgent care type setting. And I'm wondering what you can tell me about the, the health impacts of the <coughs> rest of people not having consistent primary care. So this is a problem that we see every day. What happens when people don't have a primary care physician or clinician to see, um, they put off their preventative care. And so um, medical conditions are either discovered late, um, they may miss their same mammogram screening and discover that they have a breast cancer that could have been easily or more easily treated two years in advance, or they show up to the emergency room when they're in what we call decompensated congestive heart failure meaning that they have to be admitted to the hospital, where if they could have seen their physician two or three or four days earlier, um, we may have been able to make some medication changes and prevented that ER visit and that hospitalization. So it's definitely something that we are seeing happen more and more frequently. Um, our urgent cares and our ERs are, um, very, are very capable of reaching out to primary care offices and saying, this is someone that absolutely needs to be seen you know, soon for follow-up. But the reality is, is that our practices are, are full and the access to that care um, is often, if it needs to be within 24 hours, often can't be met for um, several days beyond that. I'll just add, I mean, obviously as, um, as family physicians, this is what we do all day every day. And it's so important for us to, to know our patients and to have them have a, a medical home. Um, when they go to you know ER urgent care, obviously it is an issue on many levels because it's much more expensive care mm -hmm. and it doesn't need to be that expensive. And um, because you know we know the patients best, and this is what we are always saying to our own patients who, who do have a medical home, we know you best. We know all of the little things that are adding into the, the problem at hand at that moment that somebody at urgent care doing their best don't really know that. So there are many factors, medical, social, transportation, economic, there are so many things that, that go into when somebody is presenting for care. So we always are encouraging people, stick with your medical home. So it's a really critical problem when some people are not able to have access to that primary care, a primary care physician who knows them the best. So you mentioned that you have co-sponsors of this bill in the Senate on the Republican side. Is that an indication that that you have a comfortable relationship with people on the other end of the other side of the aisle rather than 
In other words, you were able to approach people who you thought could work on this with you? No, or absolutely. They, they, they thought that you were <coughs> Look, I do every single thing I can <coughs> to find any ally in the Senate, Republican or Democrat, to help us do things that are good for Vermonters. But what I've found is that a lot of the challenges that we face in Vermont, like the pressure on our primary care physicians, that's universal. That's around the country. And that's a reflection of a broken health care system that's got to be fixed. So, you know, folks in, uh, in Alabama that Senator Bozeman represents um, are having doctors just like uh, Toby and Ann, okay, just like them who care deeply about their patients getting squeezed on being able to keep the lights on in the office. So, you know, my approach on things is what are the challenges that we have for Vermonters? And more often than not, those are the same challenges that face good people in Alabama, good people in Kansas. Uh, so that's the approach I take. And I do enjoy working with my Republican colleagues or Democratic colleagues. But I would, you know, we're, just to go back, <clears throat> one of the things that I believe as a patient uh, and my family members who've uh, been patients is so profoundly important is to have a real relationship with a physician where you're not just all uptight when you have to make a call to the office. And we are. If you try to call a hospital, you know what's going to happen. You call your doctor. It's somebody that knows you. They might know, you know, what sports your son or daughter plays. Uh, they probably know members of your uh, extended family. You have this confidence that they're not going to think you're asking a stupid question when you call up. And it's going to motivate you or it's going to empower you, essentially, because it comes from trust. And I also believe, and this is again my experience, that so much of what each of us has to do to maintain our health requires personal responsibility, you know, to deal with your dietary, to deal with exercise, uh, to face some of the emotional challenges you have. You need a trusted person who accepts you. And that's what the primary care physician does. They know you, they have a sense of your vulnerabilities, and they can give you that little prod that can allow you the confidence you need to take control of some of your behaviors that'll help you be a, a healthier person. So, you know, as I see it, with all the talk we have about healthcare reform and how you finance it, uh, that is all incredibly important. But we cannot have a system that puts the squeeze on the gateway to good health. And that is our primary care doctors. That's who it is. So the idea that we're met nickel and dime in them uh, about when they get reimbursed to the point where they have to turn the lights off uh, is just a profound indictment of our health care system. And my colleagues that are on this bill, Senator Sheen, I didn't mention her, you know, New Hampshire has an enormous amount of rural uh, uh, parts to its state. That's what we share in common. We believe that. And it's not about uh, big political positions. It's about, like, the obvious. You need a doctor that you trust and uh, is going to be there uh, when you get sick or when a loved one gets sick. So I see this as absolutely profoundly important for the well-being of Vermonters and Americans. Thank you. <laughs>